Thank you so much, Catherine. And I'm really excited today to have the opportunity uh, to tell you a little bit about our uh, 4D initiative in deep time data-driven discovery and the evolution of planetary systems. Where's that clicker? So uh, this came about from the Deep Time Data Infrastructure Project. This, of course, was in part funded by the Deep Carbon Observatory and the Sloan Foundation. And with this project, we were tasked with the goal of better understanding the coevolution of the geosphere and biosphere from a data-driven perspective. Through this project uh, came questions that are still driving 4D today, and that are things like, how do planets evolve through deep time, and what are the drivers behind their similarities and differences? How can we deconvolve and characterize the complex feedback systems between the geosphere and biosphere? What physical and chemical parameters control planetary habitability? And what are the most robust and unambiguous biosignatures that uh, we, and how can we detect them on other planets? So with these questions in mind and with the very generous uh, funding of the Sloan Foundation and the Deep Carbon Observatory, uh, we brought together over 100 scientists from many different fields of Earth, space, life, and data scientists to see if we could integrate our expertise and begin to answer some questions, some big outstanding science questions that uh, one field alone could not address. Um, out of this workshop, we have a white paper, which is available on our website, and we also have a fantastic uh, cross-disciplinary international network. And I'm going to hit on a couple things that have already been mentioned by a few of the other speakers, and that is that we have some great opportunities here. So first, we have the opportunity to ask compelling science questions that is at the interface of our fields. DCO is an amazing example of how bringing together different fields can begin to tackle some amazing uh, questions. We also have the opportunity to harness and integrate some of the existing data resources, including dark data. Uh, and we can also apply advanced analytics and visualization techniques to exploit uh, the multidimensionality of these very complex systems. And lastly, we can create open access data resources and we can train the next generation. So I'd like to just give you four very brief uh, intros to a couple of the projects that we've been working on uh, in 4D. And I'd like to just point out our data science team. Uh, this is Peter Fox at RPI and Marshall Ma at, at University of Idaho and their teams. Of course, this is a collaboration that came about uh, strictly through the, through the Deep Carbon Observatory and none of this work you're about to see would be possible without them. So first, let's talk a bit about network analysis. So the premise here uh, in mineral network analysis is that the diversity and distribution as well as the composition of minerals provide a framework for answering questions um, and making predictions regarding the timing, extent, underlying causes, and relationships between complex geologic, uh, biologic, and planetary uh, processes and features through deep time. And the question we had is, is how do we deal with these complex systems? How can we visualize and analyze uh, this, this extreme multidimensionality that we have? <clears throat> so here we're looking at a carbon mineral network. Um, you'll see the colored nodes represent carbon mineral species, things like calcite and aragonite. And they're colored according to their age, and they're sized according to the number of localities that they occur at. And uh, the black nodes represent carbon mineral localities sized according to their diversity. There are a lot of things I could point out here, but um, I'll just mention one, is, and that is that we may be looking at a planetary scale biosignature. Uh, why is that? That is because um, Earth's mineral diversity and distribution is unique. Uh, we have a frequency distribution of minerals on Earth. It follows an LNRE, or large number of rare events, uh, distribution. Dan Hummer is going to talk a little bit more about this in his carbon mineral challenge talk. Um, but basically, this is that most mineral species are rare, and there are only a few that are very common. So when you couple this with the high mineral diversity, over 5,500 mineral species as of today, uh, and you look at other planetary systems like Mars, the Moon, and Vesta, they have on the order of hundreds of mineral species that occur frequently, and they're lacking rare species and high diversity. So I'd like to show another feature of networks, and that is uh, embedded timelines. I could have shown you this on the carbon network, but I thought we'd mix it up a little bit and look at a network of coexistence of animal families. Um, so here we have uh, an embedded timeline, as you can probably immediately see, um, going from Cambrian fauna into modern day. Now I'd like to note that time was not encoded in the layout of this network in any way. It's only coexistence. So the fact that we can see a timeline means it's intrinsic to this data, which makes sense in, a, in an evolving 
uh, system. So I'd also like to point out these pinch points. These were really interesting features, and it turns out they correspond to known mass extinction events in the fossil record. This was great because when we're using a new technique, um, we want to make sure it can tell us what we already know to be true, of course, right? But it also gives us a tool. Um, now when we go to a different type of network, like my colleague Drew Macenti did when he went to the trilobite fossil record, and when we notice a pinch point like this one here, um, you can say, oh, there's something going on there. So he actually investigated this time period and found that there was indeed a previously unknown massive faunal turnover event. So he was able to recognize that just looking at the network topology. Uh, please check out the live demo. Um, we, are, we are trying to figure out different ways to visualize our data, and one of the areas we're exploring is virtual reality. So uh, in room 125 at Carnegie, uh, we'll have a setup so you guys can play with this. They're really neat, so please check it out. Um, the next project I'd like to mention is mineral affinity analysis. So the question that we really wanted to get at here is how can we predict the location of unknown mineral occurrences, deposits, or specific environments? Um, so a recommender system is a system, uh, is a, is a system that characterizes multidimensional co-occurrence relationships and creates a probabilistic model for predicting uh, future or currently unknown uh, co-occurrences. So if you've ever used Amazon and it's suggested that you buy things, you are familiar with this type of algorithm. Uh, so essentially we generate association rules and it kind of looks like this. So if I have these four minerals, there's a certain probability of finding the fifth mineral there. Um, and what this allows us to do is ask questions like, where can I find a certain mineral that I'm interested in? If I have a certain location that I'm interested in, what other minerals form there that we don't already know about? And what I'm most interested in is where can I find a deposit or an environment, say a Mars analog site, that's characterized by a certain mineral assemblage? And we actually have some uh, ground truthing of this, so we implemented a very simple pairwise version of this algorithm, uh, and the folks over at MINDAT were actually able to go out there and find a, a sample of the wolfenite that we predicted to exist at Cook's Peak District in New Mexico. So it was exciting to have some, some ground truthing of this algorithm. The third project I'd like to mention, I'm, I'm really excited about, and this is natural kind clustering. So basically, Minerals are incredibly information rich, and they offer the opportunity to integrate their uh, diverse characteristics and parameters to gain a more multidimensional, multivariate uh, perspective of dynamic chemical, geological, and processes uh, through, through deep time. So the, the question I'm really interested in here is, how do we determine the formational environment of a mineral? So for instance, if I find a sample of pyrite on Mars, what does that tell me about how it formed? Not a lot, unfortunately. Um, but I want to know, was there any biological mediation involved in the formation of this mineral? So we turned to our colleagues, uh, Ross Large and Dan Gregory, and they very generously provided us with an amazing database of thousands of uh, geochemical analyses of pyrite, major, minor, trace, uh, isotopic ratios, and we were able to look at uh, their, their multivariate correlations and use cluster analysis to find groups within these data. And it turns out these groups correspond to the formational environment. So what this means is if I find a pyrite sample on Mars or you give me a sample of pyrite and you don't know how it formed, I can tell you how that formed. Our group can actually tell you that with this information, which I think is, is pretty cool. Um, the last project I'd like to just mention briefly really came out of the DCO too. So this idea came from the DCO St. Andrews meeting um, from a few of us chatting there, and it ended up uh, making its way into a proposal for a NASA Astrobiology Institute node, which got funded uh, at Rutgers. Uh, it's called Enigma. And uh, basically here the idea is that we're taking metagenomic data and we're relating it to the geochemical environment. So we're trying to understand what are the complex feedbacks between the geochemical environment and the microbial populations that are present. So we want to understand are there, are microbial populations constrained by their geochemical environments and vice versa? And did metal availability through deep time affect protein evolution? So the DCO has done an amazing job of compiling data resources and of bringing together different fields. I mean, they've truly been a pioneer uh, in this integrative type of science. So we are very much so following uh, in, those, in those footsteps, and we're also bringing in advanced analytics and, and visualization. We're getting out of the, the XY plots and really trying to look at the multidimensionality of these systems. I've heard it often said before that multidimensionality is a curse. Uh, it's not a curse. It's an amazing opportunity for us to really characterize these complex systems. 
So the 4D future plans, um, we're going to host a number of workshops, including um, an intro to data science. So this is if you uh, don't know how to code, if you haven't done anything like this before, um, which was me two to three years ago. I'm honestly not much, much past that now. But um, we're going to host some, some intro to data science courses uh, so that we can kind of see how people can get started. We'll also do some more technique-specific courses, probably at, at, at um, conferences, AGU, Goldschmidt, things like that, on cluster analysis, network analysis and so on. Uh, and we'll also host a, a workshop or two and thinking about a cross-disciplinary question, so a scientific question that we can really dig, dig down into. Uh, we also have a number of datathons. We have one next week and one the following week, uh, so we have quite a few of those going on. Um, and we will have a internship and visiting scholar opportunities. So if any of you are interested in that, please let me know. Um, we're also uh, always looking for, for new collaborations and new ideas, so please come and talk to any of the, any of the 4D folks. Uh, and we're also uh, in a fundraising mode. Um, so if you'd like to check out uh, any of our live networks, you can actually manipulate these on the DTDI website. Um, and please check out the, the 4D initiative website. It's, it's still under construction, but there's quite a bit of good information up there, including uh, our white paper. So I'd like to thank my many, many collaborators and our many, many funders, but I'd most of all like to thank the Deep Carbon Observatory and the Sloan Foundation. Uh, without, uh, without the DCO and without Sloan, uh, 4D would certainly not be happening. So thank you so much for that. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you very much. Are there questions? Hi, Jeff. Yes. yes. Uh, what's a datathon? Oh, what's a datathon? Good question. Um, I didn't know that three years ago when Peter Fox's group taught me that. And now they're the only way I like to have meetings. Um, basically, we, we come together on either a common question, you know, so say I have a research question that I'm really interested in answering, or I have a data set that I don't exactly know what questions I even should be asking. You know, I know that I, there's something hidden in this data set, but how do I find that information? Uh, so we come together with, we bring our data, we all sit in the same room together, and um, honestly, there's a lot of data cleaning that goes on in that, so if we can do that in advance, it's nice. Um, so we'll clean the data, and then everyone will kind of start exploring it in their own way, so each person will take kind of their own approach to trying to figure out what correlations are in there, trying out different visualizations, and exploring the data um, depending upon you know, what your question is or if it's truly just exploratory. So by the end of it, we end up with um, a matrix of, of tasks and goals and scientific questions that we're asking and usually papers that we're going to write. Uh, it's rare that we have a datathon that we don't have multiple papers <laughs> coming out of. So, so they're pretty cool. And I know you're right down the road. So if you have any interest in, in, this goes to all of you, if you have any interest in participating in one of our datathons, please let me know. If you have a, if you have a data set that you're interested in exploring, um, we can do that remotely. We can do that through a datathon. Um, just let us know. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Well, if.